What's up, everyone, and welcome to episode 282 of Two Amazon Sellers and a Microphone, brought to you by Solozo. And uh, today, we're going to have a lot of fun, can already tell. Uh, I guess it's bringing some energy, so it's going to be a good, good conversation. But we're going to be talking about, look, this is what everybody wants. Quit your job. Become an Amazon seller. You know, how can you replace your income and, and live the life that you want? Uh, and so we're definitely talking to someone who's done that and helps uh, coach and train others to do the same thing. So joining us to talk about all this and more is Lewis Moore. How's it going, Lewis? I'm doing good, Dustin. Thank you for having me on. And how are you guys? We're great. Can't good. We're getting ready to roll. Yeah. Well, we're really good because the Chiefs won yesterday. So we, we're big Chiefs fans here in Kansas City and love to see it. I can tell by the hat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Chris, where's yours, man? You forgot yours today? Come I on. I forgot my stuff. Normally I got like the Chiefs stuff in the background going on. I don't have none of that today. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, Lewis, we're, we're really excited. I mean, I know a lot of what you uh, what you do is uh, like online arbitrage and retail arbitrage. Uh, people that have listened to this uh, podcast in the past know that I've been uh, dabbling in that for like the last year or so. So I'm sure I'll have lots of uh, questions pertinent uh, to this. But uh, for everyone who's tuning in, hasn't he hasn't heard of you, hasn't met you, would love to give you the floor and uh, just. Tell us about yourself. What were you doing previous to uh, you know e-commerce, and then what got you started and and just the journey through uh, through Amazon selling. Okay. Um, so, hello. My name is Lewis Moore the third. I am an Amazon. I like to say I'm a digital entrepreneur, but my main thing is Amazon FBA. Um, I also create Amazon content on my YouTube channel, and I have a podcast also, um, and a lot of Instagram and TikTok reels. Uh, and I teach people how to do pretty much what I did, which was, I like to say I quit my job. Because I was going to quit my job, but then I got fired before they beat me to it. So I got fired before I was able to quit. But um, I did that and I started my, luckily I started my Amazon business a couple of years before that. That's why I was going to quit. But like I tell my students, if you're able to ride out your job, then why not have two sources of income? And that's what I was doing until I got fired. And then I was like, hmm, this month I made more am selling on Amazon than I did with my um, working with my job. So what's the point of going back to the job? I can take that time and put more into doing Amazon and it scaled and scaled. And then I started teaching people how to sell on Amazon. And now I do that. I teach people how to do, how to sell on Amazon. And I like to talk about other things. Cause I think the, from my experience, the reason that people fail on Amazon isn't because they don't have enough information. Cause you can get information from anywhere on the internet. That's not hard to do, but it's more things like organization, being motivated, um, being disciplined and actually doing the things that need to be done. Because a lot of people don't know how to get self-started. They need like a boss to tell them to, to do it. So I try to teach people how to be self-starters and get things done by themselves. So that's pretty much who I am. When did you when did you find Amazon? How did you find it? When did you find it? What was what was that process like? Um, it was 2020 or no, it was 2019. I had just got fired from another job. Throughout the story, you're going to find out that I've been fired from like every job that I ever had. I, I was a terrible employee. But um, I got fired and I got tired of being fired and having to start all over. So I was like, what can I do to kind of supplement my income? And I learned about making money online. And the first thing I did was I had a blog about the keto diet, if you guys know what that is. Yep. And I was doing it on Pinterest. And I that was the first time I ever made money online. I made like... I started making like twelve hundred dollars a month, and I was like, "Wow, cool!" Yeah, it took it took. Wait, 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 wait. what were you doing there? So it's like <laughs> keto to Pinterest blog to Pinterest to ClickBank. No, it was no. It was um. What I would do is I would take recipes, I would rewrite the recipes, and I would make um pictures of them on um, on Pinterest, and then just flood Pinterest with like six to seven pins every single day. And eventually, people started clicking onto my um blog, and that's how I got my traffic. And um, I got like ninety percent of my traffic from Pinterest, and. Then I guess I took somebody's photo without asking and they reported me to Pinterest and they end up banning me from um, Pinterest. And when 90, 90 and when 90 percent of my traffic was coming from Pinterest, it went from 100,000 views a month to like 6,000 views. So it was just done. Uh. But that taught me that you can actually make money online. So it got me started. And then I got fired from my next job and 
I had like a whole bunch of different shoes, a whole bunch of different Jordans. And it was a real bad time for me at that situation. And my girlfriend at the time was like, why don't you sell your shoes on eBay? So I started on eBay with it. And in like two months, I sold like 40 pair of shoes. So I was like, oh, wow, this is really something. So I did eBay for about a month or two. And I'm the type of person who always wants to learn new things. So I started doing research on eBay and I slowly found out about Amazon. I don't know exactly how, but then I moved over to Amazon. And once I found Amazon, I just stopped doing everything else and went really hard on Amazon. And then when you found Amazon, you're doing uh, retail ARB now. So then what was that process like? How did you get going with Amazon? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, at that time, I was still poor. Like, so I didn't want to be poor anymore, but I didn't have like a lot of money to be able to put into Amazon. So I started with books. I was doing used books. I would go to the thrift stores and find used books. And then that was in 2019. And I did that for about six months. And then the pandemic happened and then the lockdowns happened. So all the thrift stores got closed. So I wasn't able to get any more books. So I was like, okay, well, this is over with. Let me move on to the next thing. But my mentor at the time was like, do you know one store that's never closed during a pandemic or anything? And I was like, what? And she's like grocery stores. So why don't you start selling groceries? So I learned about that. And then I started selling groceries and I got it up to making about twenty five thousand a month. And then I moved from groceries to doing full online arbitrage with all these other type of things. Twenty five thousand a month for revenue or profit? Revenue, 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 not profit, no revenue. Yeah, still, it's still good. It's yeah. still real good. I mean, if I mean, if your margins are are reasonable, that's that certainly can replace a salary. It did, it did, it did. That was that was that was at that time that gave me the confidence to not look for another job when I got fired because of the whole pan pandemic stuff. So, so Lewis, were you going to grocery stores and just buying regular stuff on the shelves and just relisting it and selling it on Amazon? When I first started, I spent hours in the grocery store. I tell my, I wanted it really, really bad. So I would go to the grocery store and spend two hours in there. And I spent so much time in there. People were asking me, like, they thought that I worked there. And I knew the answers to the questions that they were asking me. I'm like, yeah, ketchup is over there and the bathroom is over there. And I would just literally buy those things and then send them into Amazon. And then that's how I started. What were you using? Were you just, were you using a scanning app to, to, do everything? Were you, did you have like leads lists? Were you, did you come prepared for what you wanted to buy or were you, what, what was that like? That was also a process because when I first started, like I said, I started with books and with books, it's more of the type of, um, way that I went with books. I just did like a shoot and spray type of thing. I just bought a whole bunch of, um, thrift, thrift, thrift store books. I didn't use Keeper. I didn't, I didn't use anything. If it was under a million rank and it didn't have that many sellers on it, I would just buy it. Most of those wouldn't sell, but I would always make more money than I wouldn't. So I took that type of thinking to doing the retail arbitrage. So I was just using the regular Amazon sellers app at, at first for like two months. And I spent like a thousand dollars on different stuff. And I was wondering why it didn't sell, but that was just because I was going off for profit and nothing else. So then I learned about Seller Amp and then I learned about Keepa. And that's when it really changed because I knew what I was doing then. And over the next couple of years, I kind of tweaked it to what I'm doing now. Now, was that because before we went live, you, you mentioned that you're in Germany right now. Yes. Was that in the United States or was that in Germany that you were doing? I was all in Germany. I just started selling in the States two months ago. So all before that was all in, in Germany. So you're doing all Look, of this. You grew up in Germany? No, 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 no. I'm American. I was born in Michigan, Detroit, Michigan. But um, in 2012, I came over here with the army. And once I got out the army, I stayed over here because I um, got married and had a kid over, over here. Gotcha. Very gotcha. Nice. Okay. Very nice. Gotcha. So, you, so you're, this is all selling on Germany's platform. Or are you doing all of Europe? Did we lose him? He froze up a little bit there. This would be interesting because if he's just doing it in Germany, there'd be a lot of opportunity for him to do it in the other marketplaces. Oh, Europe, yeah. or UK, Spain. I mean, he could branch out to all those other ones Absolutely. as well. Yeah, we'll give this him is Oh, yeah. I'm going to give him a second to see if we can get him uh, unfrozen. Okay. There he is. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, no. Go ahead. I was going to say, I live in the boonies. Like, it's just farm and um, farm stuff around here. So, I don't have really good internet. So, sorry. That's okay. No problem. So, are you selling only on German's marketplace or are you doing all, all Europe? Well, um, 
I started with just Germany and then I moved to all of all of Europe, but it's not that big because of the language barriers, because most of my stuff is in German, but food and things go good throughout Europe, but all the other stuff really is only in Germany. Gotcha. Okay. So is so you're you're buying, you're going to these grocery stores, buying yes. things, selling them. Um is that still your model or now are you doing are you buying stuff online now and having it come to you and then send it in? Well, I'm much I'm more savvy now and I have more money now. So I'm not doing that now. Now I do strictly online and um, wholesale, but I do recommend to my students who just start out. I think it's a great way to actually start out and get used to it and not and have a low amount of um, money that you have to put into it. It's the best business model. I tell everybody. I mean, it's the oldest business model also. It, you're a hundred percent right. It's just the new digital version of it. Exactly. But everything is, I mean, used cars is arbitrage. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's, <laughs> that's, I mean, there's, you're right. It's the oldest business model around. Um, and I, and Chris and I talk about this all the time because we did start as private label sellers. This okay. was, a, this was um, you know, in, independently. We didn't know each other at the time, but, and uh, this was in 2014. We sell a few things out of our house. Like we sold like knickknack stuff out of our house. Oh, yeah. Just to figure it out. Yeah, Chris, your mic's jacked up too now. Okay, I thought that was my internet. I'm like, crap. No, no, that's that's Chris. <laughs> hey, it's uh, it's a Monday. This stuff, <laughs> this stuff happens, but we'll we'll let Chris uh, get that mic fixed back up. Um, but go, can, go, I, can go I ask you a question? Yeah, um, Dustin, are you using a stand up desk? I am. Yeah, because I'm too fidgety. I can't. Do you stand like up. better than sitting? Yeah, I always stand up. Yeah, cool. yeah, I can't help myself. I. If, the only problem with the stand-up desk is sometimes I just start wandering away. <laughs> <laughs> hey, where's Dustin at? Yeah. Is you're that right. better? Much better? Yeah, Mike, yeah you're much better. But, uh, okay, so, so Lewis, we're talking about your, uh, you know, best business model. Certainly, it's the lowest risk, lowest capital investment model. I mean, you could go out, you could go to the grocery store and literally spend 20 bucks and try to flip a couple of products um, on Amazon to get your feet wet, understand the process. It's a great learning tool as well, because we always tell people if they're gonna end up being private label sellers, boy, you learn a lot doing mm -hmm. arbitrage. I mean, you, for a hundred bucks of spent buying product, you could learn you know, how to list a product, you know, what it, what it looks like shipping stuff into Amazon, mm -hmm. everything that's gonna help your, help your journey a ton. Um, exactly. So at this point now, since you're doing online, does does everything come to your house? Are you physically labeling everything and shipping it in, or do you use some sort of prep center? Um, I'm using a prep center now because I sell in the states. But before I was, I have a control problem. I don't I don't know the people who are at the at the prep center. I've heard a lot of bad stories about people that are at the prep center. So I would much rather just hire somebody and come here and have them prep it. But now it's not possible for me to do that. So I have to use the prep center. So you're doing online arbitrage in the United States now where yes. you're ordering and having it shipped to, to the prep center. It's going in there. How's that working? How's that different for you? And Because this is a question I have. I've just started using a prep center. They're mm -hmm. amazing from everything I can tell. Uh, they're arbitrage sellers themselves. So they mm -hmm. know the nuances of bundling and bubble wrapping and having a million boxes coming from a million different, you know, vendors show up and organizing it, listing it. So they've been great, but that there is a fee you're paying so that yeah. you wouldn't pay if you're doing it yourself. And so it kind of changes the numbers when you're buying. Um, but what are your thoughts on that? How does that been for you in comparison to how you're doing it yourself? Um, like, like I just said, I'm a very controlling person when it comes to my business. And one thing I'm trying to do this year, I say, is I'm trying to let go and delegate things. So it's great in that way to letting somebody else do the heavy lifting so I can do something else like work on my content or things like that. But I still got to get used to ordering something and never, ever seeing it. That's very still new to me, like never seeing it, never being able to hold it, never to do anything like that. And just trusting somebody else with which with such a big part of my business. But so far, it's been going good. It's been better than I thought it was going, going to be. And what's, so what's your what day to day look like? like? Yeah, what's um, your what's I, your I wish I could show you my schedule. My schedule. I'm a very structured person, like 8:30 this, 9:30 this, 10:30 this. So pretty much I wake up between four and five, 
and then I have an hour of where I just play video games. That's like my treat for like waking up. And then I go work out, take a shower, and then I sit down. And from eight to 10, that's when I go through my leads list and I talk to my VAs and I do all that type of stuff. I order, I check my um, Amazon thing. So I work on my Amazon for about two and a half hours. Then I do some writing. I'm trying to write more. So I write for like an hour. Then I have lunch. And then the afternoon is for a content creation. And then the nighttime is just to study or watch podcasts like you guys or just take in more information. I like it. You're very mm -hmm. strict. It's, was that the military? Were you structured? Well, before? Said, honestly, no, I was a terrible soldier. It's, it's, it's <laughs> not that. It's just that I've learned over time how I work. And to get the best out of me, it has to be very, very structured. So if it's not structured, then I'm just all over the place. Let me ask you a question, an entrepreneurial question, because yes. you're talking about getting fired. Uh, you just said you weren't the, you know, you self-admittedly, you weren't the best uh, soldier. All this stuff. Do, you, worse. <laughs> do you think that that's because you've got like a natural entrepreneurial, like yes. fire in you that you just, if it's not you dictating it, it's not the same and you don't give yes. it the same passion? Yes. I see there's this saying that they say good entrepreneurs make good employees. And I personally don't believe that because I think the things you need to be an entrepreneur are the total opposite of the things that you need to be an employee. And I'm not saying one is better than the other, but I just think it's better as a person if you know which one you are, because it'll make life a lot easier. And when I was trying to fit myself into the employee Thing, it just didn't work. It caused a lot of trouble in, in my life and pain. And I, I hated to go to work and I hated to do this. But as an entrepreneur, I have more stress, but I like that stress more because I'm able to control it and be able to pick what it is and when and when it is. So I really do believe that I wasn't a good employee just because my brain doesn't work that way. I'm not a person to, hey, just go do this. I want to know why. I want to know, does it make sense? I want to know if there's any other options to do it. And as an employee, who am I to be questioning people? So, yes, I think. Yes. I love it. Yeah, I I think Chris and I can understand that entirely. <laughs> uh, for sure. There's a, there's an entrepreneurial spirit that is strong. And if you're not, and just like you said, you're, it sounds like you're constantly learning uh, new business models, other ways to make money. You're doing content. Uh, you're helping people now. You're coaching and training, which we're going to talk about uh, in a second. But I want to talk about the, the point where you really started to scale and what that looked like. Because you mentioned VAs. So I'd love to know sort of what tasks you're assigning to your VAs, but also uh, you mentioned leads lists. And I mm -hmm. want to talk about like, is that where all of your uh, sourcing comes from is leads lists, or do you do a lot of your own sourcing as well? And how do you do that? Oh, I don't do no more sourcing. No, I don't do no more sourcing. I'm telling you, like the more information I learn, the more money I'm able to make with my Amazon business, the less I want to do everything in there. So pretty much it's at the point now to where I'm just the buyer. My VA sends me the list. And then I have another VA, which he's not really a VA. He's my ass assistant. He checks over the VA's list because I trained him the way I would look at it. And then he sends me an even smaller list. Like these are the ones you should buy. This is how many that you should buy and that type of stuff. And then I just go over that and I just buy the things. So is your VA sort the so the leads list comes from your va so your va you're not buying leads lists from people your va is actually sourcing this stuff well we well we haven't talked about it yet but um my community i provide a leads list to my community so i take the leads that i get the ones that i don't buy and then i'm going through those and making a leads list to give to my community and that's what i said earlier when i spend two hours sourcing i'm not sourcing for myself i'm making the leads list for the people in the community and i'm giving little notes of why i think you should buy this item at this time and those type of things okay i like it so let's talk about this this is always fascinating to me what makes what makes a good buying opportunity? I mean, are you looking at everything like the sales velocity of a certain product, uh, like the price history, how many people are competing for it? Uh, what like where what what piques your interest when you're looking at a leads list out of all of those or is it all of them? I try to make it as simple as possible. And I have a five step process that I look for with SellerAmp. And if those five things, which go um, sales rank, then it goes the um, estimated um, amount of sales. I want to be able to sell it at least 10 times. So I may have to do a little bit of math. People will say, 
oh, there's a hundred sellers on this item. That's a bad buy. But if that item is selling 2000 times, okay. I can sell it 20. I'm fine with it being a hundred people on there. It doesn't really matter to me as long as I can make money. Then it's, um, am I ungated in it? Because with the prep center, it's very hard to get ungated because of the whole address thing. So that's a so so that's the issue. So I try to stay away from things that I have to get ungated in. Um, the the um, ROI, I want to get at least thirty five percent. It was thirty, but with the prep center and them taking their money, I would need it to be a little bit higher. So at least thirty five percent. And if those things check out, then I go over to Keeper. And then in Keeper, I'm checking the um, sales rank, the buy box um, rate. Excuse me, the buy box rate. Uh, the reviews, the new offer count, and then who's getting the buy box. That's what's really important to me because it doesn't matter if I can make money from it if I'm not going to be able to get any of the buy box. And if those things check out, then I'll do a, a test buy. I personally tell my students all this Keepa and Seller Amp information is good, but it's not like guaranteed. The only way you can really know if something is, is going to sell is if you actually sell it. Because there's been plenty of times that Keeper or Seller Amp, seller amp has told me this is not good to sell or it's only going to sell five times or 10 times. And then I buy it and then it sells out in the first day. So I'm always encouraging people to, I look at it as like the casino, but I have an advantage. It's still going to be a gamble no matter what because anything can happen. I can I can send in an item and it could be the best item ever and then 50 other people get it from a leads list and now it's tanks. So I'm just saying I'm willing to bet $100 on this item that it's going to sell and that I'm going to make more money. And if it does make more money, I'm going to buy more of those items. And that's pretty much how I do my business. So you do Are you purchases all the time. You're If you thought you're, you continue to buy it. Yes, yes, yes. I tell my students that they should be doing at least three to four test buys a week. I love it. Chris, go ahead. Are you are you bundling anything? Are you making your own custom bundles where you can control like the listing? Or are you just hopping on listings and just being another seller? I'm going to start creating my own bundles, but before I didn't I didn't like it. I didn't want to have the time to do that. But now that I'm more um, like I'm more savvy with it. Now I understand how it works. So I'm going to do that. I'll make a, make a bundle and throw a, a pin in there that says Lewis Moore store or, or like something just to make it different. But I haven't started, but I am working on learning how to do that now. What are some of the things that you see new sellers struggle with that you probably may have struggled with that maybe you can help prevent that from happening? So when you, when you get new people to join your community, what are some of the things that they, just struggle with at the beginning that mm -hmm. might be something you can help them out with. Uh, the first thing is that they come and they expect to make a hundred thousand dollars in the first three months. <laughs> they listen to all these Amazon gurus that say, Hey, I make a hundred thousand dollars a month, but they don't realize that that's not usually how life works. You don't just hit the jackpot every time and that this is a real business that's going to take time. And I tell them straight from, I don't want anybody coming to my community with false hopes or false dreams. So I kind of crush those dreams right away and say, hey, it's going to be a job. You probably already have a job. So you're going to have to work harder. You're probably going to have to miss some birthdays. You're probably going to have to miss some nights out on, on Friday if this is what you really want. Now, if you're willing to work on it, you definitely can and one to two years re replace your job, but it's gonna be a lot of nights where you're sourcing, packing, doing this type of stuff. So the first thing is just kind of letting them know that it's not like an overnight success thing. Yeah, that's yeah. super important. You gotta set the standard. Yes, and then the next thing is um, people, I don't know. Um, I don't think a lot of people are used to working hard. So they think if something doesn't, if they don't find a product in the first three hours of them, of them sourcing, then there must be something wrong. And I'm like, no, if, if you came to me and you wanted to learn how to play the drums and you never played the drums before, you probably would be bad at playing the drums. Just yeah. like sourcing. You've never done sourcing before. So you're probably going to be bad at it. But the only way to get good at it is just to keep doing it over and over and over. So those are the, the two main things. Oh, boy, that's the truth. Because uh, there's a lot of, I mean, it sounds on the surface, it's really simple. You're mm -hmm. buying low and you're selling higher somewhere else. Yes. But there is a lot more that goes into it. I mean, you even mentioned ungated. I mean, when I first started, I can't even tell you how many times I bought something, not even really realizing I was ungated for it. And now I'm just sitting on inventory that I got to return or mm -hmm. sell somewhere else. 
Uh, but then you're talking about competition and you're talking about like price tanks, like, you know, the, the worst thing that could happen, I feel like to an arbitrage seller is you buy 20, 30 units of something. All the numbers are correct. You ship it in. All the numbers are still good. It goes through FC transfers. It's still good. And the second it goes live, the price in the buy box drops way below where you're profitable. And yes. You're like, ah, yes. What do, you, what do you do then, Lewis? Do you? Do I just, I just wait. I just wait it, wait it, wait it out. I personally don't want to have anything in my inventory for more than ninety days. So I'll wait those ninety days because most of the time that when that happens, the price is going to bounce right back up to where it is. Like I've noticed. Amazon prices pretty much stay the same. You can look back three months, nine months. It's always going to be like around the same thing, which goes back to your sourcing. You should source better and try to get a buy box line that is so tight, as tight as possible without too many very, very variations. But then if it's over 90 days and it's still low, I just liquidate it because I already get back a little bit of money, then get back sure. no money. Yeah. And then be paying storage fees. Or storage fees and like all those type of things. Yeah. So you, you'll let it ride for 90 days, uh, yes. hoping for the bounce back, and then and then you'll liquidate it. So during that time, I mean, I, I'm assuming you're obviously using a repricer. Uh, mm -hmm. Be cool. Be cool. Okay. Let's check that out. Uh, I think, did we have Be Cool on the podcast, Chris? I can't you remember. Probably, you probably have because they've been doing, they have a... Um, I don't work for them, but they have AI 2.0 coming out and they've been doing their rounds of um, going on podcasts and yeah. like things like that. So maybe. Yeah. Oof. We have so many podcasts. Sometimes it's hard to keep them straight. And I, I, I want to ask you a question. I'm, I'm sorry. This has nothing to do with Amazon, but I'm only on number 47 of my podcast and this is number 200 and what? 82. Do you ever get people that write you and say, do you remember what you said in podcast six? And you're like, I don't remember what I said in podcast 281. Yes. Yeah, like, like, yeah, I can't remember right now everybody we've had on. Yeah, uh, like I was just drawing a blank on it. Yeah, but, but the, I'll tell you what. I mean, you and Chris can attest to this. This podcast has been the most fun and probably the best thing. If it wasn't for this podcast, I wouldn't be doing arbitrage. We just had so mm -hmm. many people come on that were doing arbitrage, and I'm like, I, I've got to start. I mean, I, why, why am I missing out? I'm doing private label and doing this other stuff. Why, I mean, why wouldn't I start this? I mean, that's how I got hooked up with the great leads list. Because someone was on our podcast with that. That's how I figured out uh, about a repricer to use. Uh, that's why I talk to people like you, Lewis, and we just kind of throw strategies around. Like I'm always tinkering around with how long do I, you know, wait before I liquidate something. Um, you know, I, there's all kinds of different strategies. So this podcast has been the best thing for us just in terms of network, community, knowledge, it's it's a blast. So you'll, you'll be at 282 in no time. I hope so. Um, one last question. Do you, how do you, because with you guys have a lot of guests on, how do you do when guests aren't really that good? Like, how do you, like, what do you do if they're yeah. not really talkative or they don't know what to talk about or they're not just good on camera? This is where it helps to have two people. Um, to bounce off of each other, right? Yeah, bounce off each other. And some topics Dustin is more knowledgeable about than I am mm -hmm. and, and the other way around. But we can bounce off each other. And normally what that does is that gets the third one to interact with the both of us. And so they start answering our questions and asking. It just it, It's really good to have somebody you can bounce off of. Okay. So um, okay. it, it's nice to do that. And if you... If it's if you're doing solo, normally those episodes are a little bit shorter. So <laughs> I was gonna say if you ever go to my podcast and you see an episode that's less than 20 minutes, then you probably know why it's less than 20 minutes. I know minutes. why it's less than 20 minutes. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I mean it does happen. Some people are uncomfortable uh, a little bit being on camera or they they act different a little bit, uh, or they don't really, you know, they're kind of don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> Sometimes we've had some. Has that ever happened where you were listening to somebody and you were like, "They're they're lying. They don't know what they're talking about." <laughs> we won't say who, but <laughs> no, silent... I'm not gonna ask you who. I'm not going to ask you who. <laughs> the the silence speaks for itself. Yeah, <laughs> it it definitely happens. Um, well, you know, that's but to a... Dustin's point, it's a great way to like get around and network for people. You know, D Dustin and I live in the same city, 
but this is also a good way for us to stay in contact. Oh, uh, yeah. He's about 45 minutes away from me, but it's a good time for us to get in contact. And then we, when we go to trade shows or whatever, we meet the people that came on the podcast. So it's just like a good networking opportunity. Nice. nice. Yeah. And I really feel like the, you know, what makes Amazon fun, uh, whether you're private label or whether you do whatever model, wholesale, whatever, is there's a game, a competitive aspect to it. Uh, and the, and the rules change like every day. <laughs> that's the, you know, that's like Amazon can release a new feature or whatever, or get rid of a feature. What's that? They can get rid of a feature. They can get yes. rid of a feature. That's <laughs> yeah. There's a lot that, that happens. And, you know, sometimes because of this podcast, we like, we know about it before it happens and that would never be the case ever um, before that. But yeah, it's fun. It, it's a blast. I mean, that's what makes this really fun. That's what makes entrepreneurship fun is networking with others. You know, you do have to be able to keep motivated. I'll tell you what, you, you mentioned um, motivation and like, you know, because arbitrage is a pretty simple math. It's like if you want to make X amount of money, you're going to have to spend X amount and spend and make this many purchases, basically. So if you don't, if you don't meet that, you won't get your goal. But that's it's pretty simple math. Uh so sometimes, I mean, I'm pretty busy. We've got a lot of stuff going on, but you know, sometimes I'll realize, like, you know, I, I've been slipping for like the last couple of days where I'm not buying mm -hmm. as much as I normally do. But the one benefit of having a uh, a three PL was that was what the requirement is they've got a minimum now of how many units that go through. That's been the best thing that's ever happened to me. It sounds like that'd be terrible, but it's the best because I'm like I'm forcing myself to make sure I I hit those numbers, um, which is beneficial to me. <laughs> I can see that definitely. I can see how it gives you like a, a goal that you have to reach every like month or every week or however it's um, set up. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, what what's next for you, Lewis? What are you doing next? Like you've, you've done the eBay, you've done the books, you've done arbitrage. What about wholesale? You going into wholesale anytime soon? I go back and forth with Amazon. Like Oh, I, I, I love it. I want to be an eight figure Amazon seller and be the biggest Amazon seller in the world. And then the next day I wake up and say, I don't like Amazon. I want to go do something else. So it just depends on how you ask me. I do like the Amazon FBA model. If it wasn't for FBA, I probably would not be selling on Amazon. If it was just FBM, I would not be doing it. Yeah. But um, right now I want to get, I want to change this. Okay. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm changing the way I do my personal model. I want to do more wholesale, but I want to focus more on certain products than just doing everything, if that makes yeah. sense. Like now it's just yep. whatever's on sale, I'm going to make money on it. And you like you can make money on it. I've done it, but it's not predictable. I don't know what's going to be on sale tomorrow. I don't know what websites are going to be on sale tomorrow. So I want to get it more to where it's more predictable. And I guess that's going to have to be wholesale. Yeah, get like a small catalog of just yeah. replans and just focus on those and be the best at those. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Good. Yeah. Well, there, I mean, wholesale. I mean, t typically those are your those are the largest sellers on Amazon. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're they're huge. I yeah. mean, there there's some that are doing a lot of millions of dollars <laughs> on there, uh, but but I'm just fascinated by arbitrage. What makes arbitrage so interesting to me is there's literally a billions of products out there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, there's so many ways. I mean, something I've never done, but like flipping between marketplaces, like there's got to be a whole bunch of stuff in Germany that, you know, German expats that live in the United States would love to buy, but they can't. And if you could figure out a way to get the, that product into Amazon US, you could charge, you could charge a premium and sell it. Um, there's just, there's so many, so many different, facets to it and the, the one the one last well main thing because i think for a lot of people they they get into flipping is that the repricing is sometimes where they get hung up on like setting up a repricer and what that means but what when you do a repricer what what are you your goal so you said like a 30 you like a 30 35 percent roi mm -hmm. and is that what you're setting your minimum price at on a repricer is around no that i'll set my minimum to 25 percent and if I have to go below 25%, now that's into liquidation phase, but I'll set it to, to 20 to 25%. Is there any top end that you're putting on it? I mean, 
what I do is because you know if you price it too high, you'll get those emails from Amazon like, hey, we just deactivated your listing because you can't price gouge our, our people. But um, what I do is when I'm sourcing, I'll look at the last three months on Keeper and see what's the highest that item sold at, and then that's my ceiling. Gotcha. So that's your max, and then your yes. man is right around 25% ROI. Yes. And then what about, so you test buy and then you keep buying, uh, but a lot of times, you know, this is what I, this is the last um, conversation we had with someone who's in the arbitrage space. Um, and it's in fact, somebody that I buy a leads list from. Cause I kept asking, I said, you know, I would, that was my initial idea was like, if I could find like 500 products that I could just keep ordering over and over and over and over and over again. Like I would do the work to build that, you know, test by test by. And then once it, but what I found out was most of this stuff would stop working after like a month or two months. Like it would just, it wouldn't be a vi viable buy anymore. The price had just suppressed. It was almost like, you know, and then you, then you eliminate yourself out of the, you know, you're not looking for, you know, like Macy's to have a coupon or a sale. Cause that's only a one-time buy usually anyway, mm -hmm. to get that cheap price. I was just trying to find stuff that was at Walmart uh, on the, you know, that would sell for more on Amazon. But the problem is, is everyone else figures that out too. Yeah. That's the thing um, with replans is most replans are short term re replans, meaning that they're from one month to three months. Mm -hmm. And you just have to kind of understand that that's what it is. So that's why I say you always have to be doing new test buys because those test buys are looking for the next replan. So if you're doing three to four test buys, one replan is going to fall off, but you just found two more last week. So you're always adding to your catalog. So I know like a lot of people get married to an item. Oh, this is my favorite item. I found it here. I've been selling it five times and now it doesn't sell anymore. Well, now it doesn't sell anymore. You have to move on. What do you um what do you consider a test buy? How many units is a test buy? It depends on how much money that you have because wholesalers test buys are 100, 200, 300, but just a regular person that just started be, be anything less than 5 is not a test buy. So it has to be at least 5. So I recommend between 5 to 10. Okay. What's but, the Go ahead. No, you're going to say something. I was going to say the way I do my test buys, it goes in two different phases. The first phase is just to see if the item sells. So let's say I, I sell five or 10 of them. That's fine. Then the next one, I'll send in 20. And that's when I'm trying to figure out how many I can actually sell. If I sell 20 in a day, then I can sell 600 in a month. If I sell 20 in a week, then I can sell 80 in a month. If I sell 20 in a month, then I can only sell 20. And then that's how I base what my next purchase is going to be on. It's pretty simple. Makes sense. Makes sense. What, um, man, I had a question and now it is, my fault. no, it's good, but I'm, I'm losing it. I'm losing my question. I can't find it, but, uh, um, well, let's talk, I'll, I'll think of it here in a second, but let's, let's talk about, um, the Amazon hustle Academy. So you're sure. helping, you're helping people now and we're, we're definitely going to let people know how to, how to get in contact with you and join it. But how, do, how has that been for you? The, how, is it, you know, being able to see other people succeeding and helping them? What, what's that feel like to you? That is one of the best feelings to get a message and tell somebody and have somebody say, hey, you helped me do this. And I was able to start my business and now I'm making an extra 2000 3000 4000 a month and I'm able to pay for this or pay for that or just helping people. Just helping people do what I did is very fulfilling. And I think me personally, I don't mean this by anything, but I think Amazon is a very, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say selfish, but of course you're helping people, but it's kind of a, a, a selfish business thing. So to help other people be able to change their lives is, is really um, rewarding. $2,000 extra a month is life changing for a lot of yes. people. Yes, it is. It yeah. is. And then that skill can turn that, I mean, it could be way more than $2,000 a month. It I can. mean, some of the people we talk to that are in arbitrage, it's like, mind-boggling <laughs> how much money that they're making right yes it's mind-boggling but um okay so how do people get involved with you it's they go to my, the amazon hustle academy.com yeah they can go there and they can sign up for their first but i would recommend talk to me first because i don't want you to sign up for something that you don't need like i don't want you to pay money that you're not gonna like i don't want people to come there and sign up for it and then never use it i would just rather not sign up so i want so like just send me a message on um instagram 
Yeah, well, we'll make sure that we definitely put all of that, uh, all of the contact information in the uh, show notes here. Uh, but it's fascinating. We're, Lewis, we're going to have to stay, uh, stay in touch. Uh, I'll, I'll reach out to you because it's always fun to throw things off each other. Uh, sure. Other sure. arbitrage sellers. But. Lewis, before we get out of here, uh, who, who's somebody in the space that you look up to and, and that you get information from? And, and how, do you con- how do you consume your content for Amazon? This is going to sound bad. <laughs> I don't, I mean, I don't really watch other Amazon sellers, but that's simply because I'm a content creator too. And I don't want to, okay. What I do is if I have an idea, like I was just writing um, an article about Amazon loans. So what I'll do is I'll go on YouTube and I'll put in Amazon loans and I'll watch a bunch of Amazon loan videos to kind of figure out the things that are missing in my information, but just, Watching somebody, well, I don't really watch that much content anyway, unless it's going to make make me better. So I don't just sit down and watch a lot of content. But there are some people that I follow on Instagram that I like their content on on like Instagram. Um, yeah, I know. Just, just in general, you, you is there anybody in in business that you like? Oh yeah, and bis- do you mean like big people or like just regular? Sure, sure. sure anybody. Um, I watch a lot of Grant Cardone. I like uh, a lot of motivational speakers like um, um, Eric Thomas and. Um, oh, Eric Thomas is good. Yeah. And a business guy I, I really like. He. Wes Watson. I don't know if you guys know Ooh. him. He's a, um, he's a very intense guy. I like I like very intense people because I think I'm, I'm very intense. I like very intense people. I like Brandon Carter. Um yeah, just those. Yeah, people. those are good. That's a good list. And you, what about you guys? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> we could go down this rabbit hole. Um, I like Grant. I think Grant's good. Mm-hmm. Uh, Eric over there that you mentioned, I liked him. I used to listen to his podcast. Yeah, and he listened to his podcast more. Um, there's a guy on Instagram I like to follow called uh, Elliot Official Elliot. Thomas, I think is his name. Can't remember his handle. But he's a good. He's motivation about like just like selling and how to get in sales and okay. motivation. Those kind of things I kind of like too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any, any of those type of stuff just kind of like, like get you going, get you motivated, get you moving. That kind of thing I like too. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I started. I mean, in 2014, I'd read Tim Ferriss's book, The Four Hour Work Week. Yeah. I mean, that basically got my mind wrapped around like you know, let's get into this e-commerce and get started. Um, so, I mean, that, that was, that had a big impression on me and just in terms of being able to have a side hustle. And did, the, you, did you know anything about side hustling before you read that book? Cause I didn't. And when I read that book, it just, I was like, people can actually live like that. You can work four hours and not yeah. <laughs> it blew my mind. Yeah. I mean, at that point, I was dabbling in all kinds of things. I mean, I, I don't know if I would have called it a side hustle or if I would have known that um, a lot of these things could be so automated uh, that, you know, that it, the, you know, even arbitrage, I mean, there's a lot of work involved, but I mean, you could grow an organization where you've got VAs doing all of your sourcing, all your buying, all your repricing. I've seen it. Um, where it can be pr- pretty passive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um so there's there's a lot of opportunity, but yeah, that book really opened my eyes to stuff. I mean, every, it was really interesting. That was that re, that was a total reframing of because um, I was a tennis professional at the time, teaching professional, where oh, okay, the, you were going to make exactly how much hours you worked, <laughs> like that was your money was time. You know, it was time. So being able to see like there was an, another way was really interesting. Uh, that book opened it up, but. Yeah, it's always, excuse me, it's always good to keep learning and love keep, you know, reading other other people that have been in the trenches and done yes. it. So, yeah. well, Lewis, uh, this has been a lot of fun. Um, everyone needs to go check you out. It yes, is muscleacademy.com. Follow him all over social. We'll make sure we have his links to social uh, in the description and the show notes. But we'll get you back on here again sometime in the future, Lewis, to see what's going on, um, you know, how you've evolved. But been a pleasure and um you know thanks everybody for tuning in we'll be back at this again on the next episode have a good day everybody